I, uh, I'm glad to be here. I hope you are too. We're going to finish up the book of Exodus, the survey of the book of Exodus. This is part two. Um, if you want to watch the video uh, or if you need the notes, um, I have extra copies. And we're going to pick up on chapter 16 today. <clears throat> when we concluded Exodus, um, our first lesson on Exodus, we went up to chapter 14 where they crossed the Red Sea and chapter 15 where they're rejoicing because of their physical salvation that God provided them from the Egyptians. And <clears throat> there will be some lessons on that that apply to our own redemption that we'll review at the end of today's sermon. So we're on page three of the notes, if you're following along in your notes, and we're going to pick up on chapter 16. In chapter 16 and 17, we're going to learn that while in the wilderness, God sometimes allowed the Israelites to go hungry and sometimes he allowed them to go a little while thirsty. Now we always focus in on his providing. And yes, he did provide. But sometimes he, he let them linger just a little while so that they could learn some lessons. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. While in the wilderness, yes, God uh, would provide them manna in the morning for food. And then he would provide quail, not every day, but on some days in the evening. And uh, they would all, he would also provide them water. But we learn a valuable lesson about this experiences of God's provision in chapter 16 and 17 from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. And he, talking about God... He humbled you and let you go hungry and fed you with the manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, in order to make you understand that man shall not live on bread alone, but man shall live on everything that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. Now, why did he allow them to go hungry and thirsty just for a little while? According to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, it was to humble them. I'm not making it through life, and I'm not going to make it to the promised land, and we're not going to make it to heaven without God. He's trying to teach them dependence, loyalty, trust, and faith in Him. So he, sometimes He'll stretch us. And, and let us linger for a little while to teach us a lesson. And then he'll provide and rescue us oftentimes at the last minute to help our faith improve, to trust, to, to trust him more. It says in the latter part of verse 3, In order to make you understand that man shall not live on bread alone, but man shall live on everything that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. And Jesus quoted this when he was tempted by Satan. In the wilderness. Likewise, today, God may, He may allow Christians to go without a particular need for a short period of time in order to humble us and to teach us to develop obedient trust in Him. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for He Himself has said, I will never desert you nor will I ever abandon you, so that we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Today God also promises faithful Christians that He will take care of their needs, not their wants, their needs. Matthew chapter 6, 31 through 33. Do not worry then, saying, What are, are we to eat or what are we to drink? Or what are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of righteousness uh, and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, excuse me, 
and all these things will be provided to you. So God's working to provide what we need, but he expects us to seek him first. All right, now we're going to go down to chapter, go over to chapter 18, verses 13 through 24. Chapter 18, 13 through 24. Here we learn from Moses' father-in-law Jethro that leaders can take on too much responsibility and that we need to learn as, as leaders, uh, whether you're elders, preachers, or uh, taking on um, some large responsibility spiritually uh, in a ministry, we can burn out. And we need to delegate some of the responsibilities to others. We learn in verse 13 that not only is Moses a deliverer and a prophet of God, but we also learn that Moses is a judge And in verse 13. We we learn in verse 14, Now when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as a judge and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people came to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, it comes to me and I judge between someone and his neighbor and make known the statutes of God and his law, laws. Now, notice he's making judgments based upon God's law, not his own opinions, not his, uh, what the culture says or um, the people that, uh, that raised him said, but on the word of God. And that's what the New Testament calls righteous judgment. And John chapter 7 and verse 24, do not judge by the outward appearance but judge with righteous judgment. And the only way that we can judge with righteous judgment is to make a judgment based upon the Word of God. The judging that is condemned in the New Testament Scriptures, if you look carefully at the context, is hypocritical judgment and judgment that's based upon appearance or judgment that's based upon without all the facts. But when you have all the facts, then you are to judge based upon the Word of God. That's why we're able to, to, to say to someone that it's wrong to do this, that, and the other because we have a thus saith the Lord. And it's right to do this, that, and the other because we have a thus saith the Lord. We are commanded to make judgments. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and chapter 6 as well. But that wasn't the problem Moses had. Moses was standing, was sitting and making judgments all day long, and there was a line of people. And it, and it was Jethro saw that this was not good. In fact, he says it. Verse 17, Moses' father-in-law then said to him, The thing you are doing is not good. You will surely wear out both yourself and these people who are with you because the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me, I will give you counsel and God be with you. You be the people's representative before God and you bring the disputes to God. Then admonish them about the statutes and the laws and make known to them the ways in which they are to walk and work uh, the work they are to do. Verse 21, furthermore, you shall select out of all the people able men, look at these qualifications, able men, who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain. They're not going to pervert their judgments based upon a bribe. And you shall place these over them as leaders of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And thus you have the beginning in the book of Exodus chapter 18, the beginning of the judges of Israel. And many scholars believe that that eventually led to the Sanhedrin Council. The same principle is seen in the New Testament uh, church where men who meet special qualifications 
1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and Titus 1, 5 through 9, they can serve as overseers of the local congregation that they serve. And they, uh, they in many respects, as an overseer, they are they're having to make judgments upon the word of God to help the people. And that's, in the New Testament, these people are called elders, they're called bishops, they're called pastors. They're all synonymous. Verse 22, Let them judge the people at all times, and let it be that they will bring to you every major matter, but they will judge every minor matter themselves, so it will be easier for them, I mean for you, and they will carry the burden with you, if you do this thing and God so uh, commands you, then you will be able to endure. Now, I understand verse 23 that Jethro is saying, this is my advice, and, if, and if, it's, if God agrees with this, then this is what you should do. And we have no indication that God uh, was displeased with this advice. You w- uh, will be able to endure Uh, Jethro tells Moses and all these people also will go to their place in peace so Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything that he had said and Jethro's advice is still needed today those in the church leadership positions should practice delegating some of their work to others and focus on tasks that only they can do this will alleviate the stress possibly increase the leader's effectiveness and give opportunities to others to both serve and to grow. Now let's do a quick review of chapter 19 through 34. Chapter 19 through 34 shows the central theme of the book of Exodus, and the central themes developed. Of course, the whole whole theme of the entire Bible is redemption. That's the, the big picture. And there is a grand picture of redemption in the book of Exodus with chapter 12, the Passover lamb, and, and chapter 14, um, the people, and 15, the people crossing the Red Sea, and then rejoicing from their deliverance by God from the Egyptians. But in chapters 19 through 34, notice that they come to Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God's going to give his special people a special law. And from there, he's going to lead them into a a special land for a special purpose, the coming of a special person, Jesus Christ. And that's kind of the, the gist or the theme of the rest of Exodus 19 through 34. And one by one, we'll look at these. When we come to chapter 19, verses 4 through 5, chapter 19, 4 through 5, one of the most beautiful passages in the entire book of Exodus is about God addressing his people. Look at Exodus 19, verse um, 5 and 6. Um, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession. God tells the Israelites, you'll be my own possession. The new King James says, special treasure. How precious is that? Look at that. My own possession, special treasure, among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, etc. Now, God's chosen people in the Old Testament were... The Israelites. But Peter takes the same text of Exodus 19, 5 and 6. And he's going to apply it to the church. Members of the church. The church today is God's special people. We are the spiritual Israel of God. They were the physical Israel of God. God's chosen people. Today the church of Christ uh, is the spiritual Israel of God. 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, 
so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We'll go to down to chapter 19, verses 9 through 15, and we learn that we should consecrate ourselves or set ourselves apart, prepare ourselves to come into the presence of God. We're not to just haphazardly go through the motions of worshiping God. But both our heart and our minds should be engaged. And um, if we get off track, and we all do get off track, we need to try to refocus and wor our worship upon God. And we don't just approach God any way we want to. We learn throughout from, from Genesis to Revelation, we learn that God doesn't allow people to approach Him just any way they want to. That's what many people do today. We have to respect his boundaries and approach him and worship him the way that he wants. Let's look at verses 9 through 15 and see what they did. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also trust in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them. Today and tomorrow, and have them wash their garments, and have them ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. But you shall set boundaries for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it, Whoever touches the mountain shall certainly be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall certainly be stoned or shot through. Whether animal or, a per, uh, or person, the violator shall not live. See, you can't approach God any way you want. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people and they washed their garments. He also said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. So they, when, they were, when they knew that on the third day they were going to go before God in the presence of God, they put their best, we would say their best foot forward. They would put, try to prepare themselves physically, mentally, and they would respect God's boundaries. How did the Israelites prepare themselves to meet God? They physically cleaned their clothes, abstained from sexual intercourse, set a boundary around the mountain, and set aside their daily routines, so together and meet the Lord on His prescribed day at His prescribed location. And that was Mount Sinai on the third day from when they got these directions. They also prepared their hearts and their minds to approach God the way he said to, respecting God's boundaries. Today, the principle is still true. We need to be careful and approach God in, um, uh, uh, in an appropriate way. Today, we too should prepare to meet with God in worship by daily trying to avoid sin and by setting ourselves apart for our normal, from our normal duty activities or daily activities to meet with the Lord at His church on His prescribed day, Sunday, the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. We should present our best self to God both physically and spiritually, ridding our thoughts of worldly concerns and mentally preparing to worship God as He is authorized respecting His boundaries. And John 4, in verse 24, the Jesus said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. That's with the proper attitude. That's where your heart is. And in truth. And the truth is God's word. So we have to follow his pattern. And John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so we also have to uh, learn to consecrate ourselves and prepared to come in God's presence. Let's go to chapter 20. Chapter 20 verses 1 through 17. At Mount Sinai, God's special people are given a special law now. God literally verbally spoke the Ten Commandments from the top of Mount Sinai 
in the hearing of all the nation of Israel. And they were scared and they didn't want to hear God's voice anymore. And they admonished uh, Moses to be uh, their mediator. And he was their mediator anyway. But he, they wanted him to tell uh, them what God said because it was such a scary experience. In Exodus 20 and verse 1, Then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now that's verse 1 and 2 are important with the rest of verses 3 through 17. Oftentimes we just focus on 3 through 17 as the Ten Commandments. But look at verse 1 and 2. Who were these Ten Commandments and all the laws that came from Mount Sinai? Who were they actually intended for? Who were they given to? God gave them to those that he brought out of the land of Egypt. I don't know about you, but he didn't take me out of the land of Egypt. And out of the house of slavery. He didn't take me out of the house of slavery in Egypt. See, it's hard for us to get our minds around it. But because our society has so perverted uh, rightly dividing the word of truth. That everybody, it seems in our society, seems to think that we're all under the Ten Commandments today. And that's just not the case. They were never given to us. You and I can neither keep them or break them, the Ten Commandments, because we have never been under them. Now, in a moment, we'll see why it seems that way. But let's look at those Ten Commandments. Don't turn me off yet. Listen, Commandments 1 through 4 deal with our relationship with God. You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, Verse 3. Verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol. Verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. These are all commands God gave Israel so that that dealt with their relationship with Him. Verses, the commandments 5 through 10 are commandments God gave Israel to deal with um, their relationship with their fellow human beings. Verse 12 says, Honor your father and your mother. Verse 13, You shall not murder. Verse 14, You shall not commit adultery. Verse 15, You shall not steal. Verse 16, You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And verse 17, You shall not covet. So, Think about Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. How that Paul teaches us that we are not under the law of Moses. Even if you are a Jew today, if you can prove your your bloodline, you're still not under the law of Moses today. Because Colossians 2.14 says, Having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which is hostile to us. See, it, the law of Moses would bring out what you did wrong, but not give you a complete uh, resolution for uh, your sin. That only came with in full with Jesus Christ. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So Colossians 2.14 says the old law of Moses was canceled. The old law of Moses was taken out of the way. And you say, well, does that include the Ten Commandments? Yes. And uh, and we'll get to the part in a moment that you might be confused on. But look at Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Therefore, you know, what's the therefore, therefore? Because the old law has been canceled. Because the old law has been taken out of the way. No one is to act as your judge in regard to food and drink. Under the old law, you had food and drink, many laws and regulations. Or in respect to festivals and new moons, we don't celebrate all those Jewish holidays. Or a Sabbath day. Don't let the, those who believe in the modern day Sabbath keeping um, distort you, you know. We're not to, no one is to judge us in, in, under those things because that law is done away. Look at verse 17. Things which are only a shadow of what is to come. The whole law 
of Moses and the sacrificial system was a shadow, a type of what was yet to come, the reality, the antitype of Jesus Christ and the church. But the substance, he says, belongs to Christ. Today, no one is under the old law of Moses, which includes the Ten Commandments. But we're under the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, and the law of Christ, Galatians 6.2. Now here, this is what I want everybody to listen to. Some people might mistakenly think that Christians are to keep the Ten Commandments today. And you might be looked at strange, uh, strangely by people who, I mean, when you say that you're not supposed to be under the Ten Commandments. Perhaps this is because nine of the ten principles of the Ten Commandments are brought out in the New Testament law of Christ. Nine of the ten principles of the Ten Commandments are brought out in the New Testament law of Christ. So people might think, oh, we're supposed to keep the Ten Commandments. Well, they weren't given to us. They were given to Israel. We are to keep the laws of Christ, the commandments of Christ. And nine of the ten are brought out. In the law of Christ. The only exception is the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. Under the law of Christ, the, we are not commanded to keep that. That principle or commandment is not brought out in the law of Christ. Christians today are to assemble and worship on the first day of the week, Sunday. Why? Because that's what the law of Christ teaches. In Mark 16 and verse 9, we see that Jesus rose on the first day of the week. In Acts chapter 2, we see that the Holy Spirit came on the first day of the week, Sunday. Pentecost is always on a Sunday. We also see that the church began in Acts 2 on a Sunday. We see in Acts 20 and verse 7 that they took the Lord's Supper on Sunday. And they preached, Paul preached a sermon on Sunday. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, we see that the early church took up a collection on Sunday, the first day of the week. And in Revelation 1.10, John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. So let's go now to chapter 21 through 23. Chapter 21 through 23, we need to remember that a na the nation of Israel needed and received a lot more instructions than just the Ten Commandments. God's ordinances of Exodus 21 through 23 were the first of many teachings that Israel would receive. And these regulations included laws about servants, restitution, personal property, social justice, and those holy days that we were talking about earlier. And it also included instructions on, 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 uh, concerning their conquest of Canaan. That's chapters 21 through 23. And that's where we're at actually in our study of Exodus on Sunday night. And we'll be in chapter 23 tonight. But in chapter 23 verse 2, there's a very uh, important message, a principle that also applies to us today. God tells the Israelites, and the principles brought out in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2 in the New Testament for Christians. You shall not follow the crowd in doing evil. You shall not follow the crowd in doing evil. We've all experienced the peer pressure, whether it be in school, from family or co-workers, friends, whatever the case may be, to conform to the world and to follow, don't go against the flow, follow the, the majority. And our culture is caught up in that. But we need to remember that Christianity is countercultural. If you know something's wrong, don't do it just because everybody else is doing it. You know, your mom and dad told you that when you was growing up. If you're going to jump off a bridge, you're going to jump off of it too. And then you say, but mom, dad, everybody's doing it. And then they probably, or they might wisely say back to you, name two. <laughs> and then the, it goes back and forth. The, word, the world pressures us to conform to its image. Marijuana, alcohol, premarital sex, immodesty, immorality. 
But God says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're to be living sacrifices. Those principles are brought out in Romans 12, 1 and 2. We need to be sanctified, consecrated people who follow the teachings of God, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week. Let's go to chapter 23, 20, verse 20. Chapter 23, verse 20, verse 23, and verse 31. And I chose those three verses just for time's sake. So now we, you know, we've covered God's special people, and they're given a special law, but they're going to be led to a special land. In Exodus 23, 20, the Bible says, Behold, God, God says, Behold, I am going to send an angel before you, to guard you along the way and bring you into the place which I have prepared. You know, the prepared place for a prepared people is the promised land, Canaan. Exodus 23, 23. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. In Exodus 23, verse 31, I will set your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness of the Euphrates River, and, and I will hand over the inhabitants of the land to you, and you will drive them out from you. Now there's a little map. I wish it was a little broader, uh, but there's a little map of the promised land up there. And, you know, notice... And maybe you never really examined it. But they're surrounded by mountain, sea, and desert. An almost impregnable defense to keep Abraham's seed in and the world out so that the Savior, Jesus Christ, could come. God's land promise was made to Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob, and then we see that he's promising the Israelites he's going to take him there and his messenger, the angel, is going to go before him, them. But they entered the promised land. They conquered it. There's some people that teach today that Israel uh, has never, this promise, the land promise has never been fulfilled. But it was, and they want to entwine that in their false premillennial doctrines and the, the land promise has to be fulfilled and uh, before this, that and the other can happen. But it was fulfilled a long time ago. It was fulfilled in the time of Joshua. You look at Joshua 21 verses 43 through 45 particularly. I'm just going to read verse 43. So the Lord gave Israel all the land not some, all the land which he had sworn to give their fathers Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And they took possession of it and lived in it. You know, it's not something in the future, as the premillennialist heresy teaches, but it was fulfilled a long, long time ago. So don't let them, don't listen to these TV shows. Send money to the Jews. God's chosen people today is the church. Don't listen to send money to the Jews and help them get their land. They've already got their land. It was taken away from them. They got to return to it because of their sin of idolatry in the Babylonian captivity, you remember? Why did God do all of this? God's special people were given a special law, led to a special land for a special purpose. The coming of a special person, Jesus Christ. That's why. The... The theme of the whole Old Testament, redemption, right? Redemption through who? Jesus Christ. The Old Testament says Jesus Christ is coming. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John says Jesus came. And the rest of the New Testament says He's coming again. And you look at the very last verse, next to the last verse of Revelation chapter 22, and verse 20, the next to the last verse of the Bible, and it also says that Jesus is coming again. That's why God did all this. Let's go to, um, and not all slides have a, uh, not all the PowerPoint, uh, not all the points have a PowerPoint slide, but chapter 24, we learn about Aaron, his sons, and the elders see God, uh, his presence from a distance, and Moses enters the mountain. 
chapter 25 through 30, God gives instructions for the tabernacle and the furnishings of, to Moses. And specifications are given for the work of the high priest and the function of the tabernacle. And then the book of Leviticus, the sacrificial priestly system and the feast days of Judaism, they're, they're elaborated on more explicitly. So I want us to think about a big powerful chapter called chapter 32, some, an incident called the golden calf. While Moses is on top of Mount Sinai receiving the tablets of stone, Aaron's at the foot of the mountain, and he makes a golden calf for uh, the people, and they're going to worship this golden calf. And Moses comes down from the mountain, and he sees this. God's already warned him. And he's talked with Joshua, and he sees with his own eyes they're already breaking the very first commandment. You shall not have, you shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 20 and verse 3. And then verse 4 says, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any, uh, or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You don't make images of birds, land animals, or fit, sea creatures and worship them. You don't make any idols. You don't have uh, no other gods before me. Well, they're already breaking that commandment. And in, if you'll read with me, Exodus 32, 19 through 20. And then I'm going to read verse 25 through 29. And it came about as soon as Moses approached the camp that he saw the calf and the people dancing, and Moses' anger burned. And he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made and completely burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. Moses has righteous indignation and part of their punishment is found in the destruction of the idol, and they're going to ingest it with their water. At the, in verse 35 of chapter 32, God's going to send a plague. But I want us to hone in on what happens in verses 25 through 29. Moses comes to a point and he says, If you're on the Lord's side, you come over here with me. And the Levites came to him. And he says, Every one of you, you take your sword and you slay those who are worshiping this idol. And it doesn't matter if they're your friend, your relative, your neighbor, you, you kill them. And 3,000 were slaughtered that day because of sin. God was so angry, he was about ready to give up on uh, the Israelite nation, and he was going to start all over with Moses. And Moses intercedes for the people. And, he, and God sends the plague at the very last verse of chapter 32. But what do we learn from all this? Sin is serious. We also learn that on the day that God's law what well, came from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments being brought down. So at the beginning of the uh, law of Moses, with the coming of the Ten Commandments and other statutes and ordinances, 3,000 souls died because of their sin. But then we learned that when the law of Christ came on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 souls were saved because of obedience. Luke said, uh, Luke, Peter said in Acts chapter uh, 2, which Luke wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And we learned that 3,000 souls were obedient that day and the Lord added them to his church, verse 41 and verse 47. Today we might think that 
We're not like these silly people. We don't have idols. We don't bow down to carved images of stone and wood. Well, we just kind of tweaked it a little bit. We still, idolatry is alive and well in our society. It's anything that we put before God. Colossians 3, 5 teaches us that covetousness or greed is idolatry. Basically, anything that we put before God in, in the place of God or that we give more importance to than God is what we are worshiping. And that might be family. Yeah, family can be your idol if you put it before God. That might be your money, your wealth, your job. It might be your recreation. You know, you're putting hiking and golfing and and fishing before God. It might be your pursuit of education or other, other interests or passions that you have. These things can become our God, our little G.O.D.s, our idols. Yahweh God, though, should come first in our lives. In Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And in Philippians chapter 1, we have Paul's statement. In Philippians chapter 1, we read in verse 21, Paul says, For to me to live is Christ. His whole life was wrapped up with Christ. That's what our lives should be, wrapped up with Christ. And to die is gain. We come to chapter 33 and we see God rejects Israel. Moses sets up the temporary tent of meeting. And Moses intercedes for the people and he sees God's glory. In chapter 34 we have another very important chapter and we learn a very important lesson. In this Chapter 34, verse 29 through 35, we see that the tablets and the covenant are renewed and Moses' face shines. He'd been in the presence of God on Mount Sinai and when he came down the mountain, the people were afraid to, to look at him too long or too directly because his face was shining and he had to cover his face with a veil. And when he would go into the tent of meeting mentioned in verse 33, He'd take the veil off when he was in the presence of God. And then when he came back out to the people, he'd cover it up. And Paul talks about this experience in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I just summarized for time's sake verses 29 through 35. And um, In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it would be nice for you to compare it with Exodus 34, 29 through 35. When you do that, you're going to learn that the significance of why Moses had the veil on his face. It was because from the moment Moses received the law from God, it was going to decrease in glory. It was only meant to be temporary. It was going to decrease in significance and power and beauty. Because, again, the old law was not given to last. It was given to check the people's sin until Jesus Christ came. Look at Galatians 3, 19, 24, and 25. Why the law then? It was added on account of violations, having been ordered through angels at the hand of the mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. The law was given, as I said a while ago, to check sin until Christ came, the seed. The seed promised back in Genesis 3 and verse 15, the seed of woman, Jesus Christ. And then Galatians 3, 24 and 25, Therefore the law has been our guardian, some versions say schoolmaster or tutor, to lead us to Christ. We can look at and the Jews can, and the Gentiles can look at, through the reading of the Scriptures, everything that happened in the Old Testament 
to the nation of Israel. We can see that they are an example that on the, our best day, we can't get pull ourselves up from our bootstraps and save ourselves. We need a Savior. We can't keep God's law perfectly. And Jesus Christ came and brought the gospel that has that grace built in with it. That doesn't mean we should abuse God's grace. But grace is built into the law of Christ to where when we, uh, when we, I look at grace as like a spiritual life insurance. We do the best we can to follow, obey the gospel, uh, grow as a Christian, work in, in the Lord's church, and we're still going to fall short, and that's where grace kicks in. But you do your best. Always do your best for God. In Romans 10 and verse uh, 4, well, I don't think I finished that. To lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith, but now the, that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. We're no longer under the law of Moses. Romans 10 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law. Galatians 2 21 teaches that Christ died in vain if people can be justified through the law of Moses, the Old Testament. Paul's point in 2 Corinthians 3 was that. The law that Moses had when he had the veil, had to veil his face, is the system that has not been that has now been taken out of the way and abolished. The glory of the old covenant fades and wanes when compared to the, the glorious light of the new covenant. In Hebrews 8, verse 13, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Don't go back under that and live. But whatever is be becoming obsolete and growing old is about to disappear. In Hebrews 10 and verse 9, he takes away the first in order to establish the second. And we're under the New Testament law of Christ today. Thank God. It's a better in every form and fashion when you look at Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. Now let's close with an invitation from the story of redemption found in the book of Exodus. The gospel is seen in the Exodus. In Exodus 12, we see that the blood of the Passover lamb prevented destruction. And Christ is our Passover lamb in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. We need the blood of Jesus on the doorposts of our souls to prevent destruction and Gehenna fire. In chapter 14 and 15, we see the gospel plan of salvation. They had to believe in their deliverer and God gave Moses, in Exodus 4, 1 through 9, God gave Moses some signs, some miracles to do to help the people believe that he was God's deliverer. Today, we have to believe in our deliverer, Jesus Christ. In John 8 and verse 24, except you believe that I am, you shall die in your sin. They had to repent and turn away from Egypt and turn toward God. And follow the directions of God. And we have to repent and turn away from sin and obey God. In Luke 13, 3, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all uh, likewise perish. They had to be baptized unto Moses or into Moses. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 2, when they crossed the Red Sea, there was water all around them. Above them in the cloud and on a wall to the right and a wall to the left. And we talked about in that previous sermon that when were they truly free from the Egyptians? When they crossed the Red Sea and God destroyed their Egyptian oppressors that had them in bondage with the Red Sea waters. That's when they were truly free. That's when they rejoiced. When are we truly free from sin? When we cross the waters of baptism if we're baptized scripturally for the right reasons. Our sins are washed away with the blood of Jesus where we contact his blood and our sins are removed. Romans chapter 6, 3 through 7, Acts 2 and verse 38. And then that's when we rejoice. That's when the Ethiopian eunuch rejoiced in Acts 8 and verse 39. And that's when the Philippian jailer and his family rejoiced in Acts 16, 32 through 34. Not before baptism because they were still in their sins. They were still lost. But after they crossed the waters of baptism, they were freed from their sin. And there was reason to celebrate. 
and to rejoice. I'll leave you with this final thought. Johnny Ramsey said the most sobering thought that he's ever learned about uh, from the book of Exodus was the following truth. When you follow these Israelites and their way to the promised land, it took one night for Israel to come out of Egypt. One night for them to leave, physically leave Egypt. But it took 40 years to get Egypt out of them. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's be living sacrifices for Jehovah God. If you have need to obey the Savior's invitation, will you come as together we stand and sing?